literature point. That is, if you look cortical autocortex responses to the clock train, which you should be familiar with the um, homework I gave to you. This clock train acoustically is discrete sequence of brief sound from a slow and going to fast and faster. But from a very slow to very fast, in their entire range, the signal itself is discrete, physically. Okay? As you uh, experience in the homework I gave it to you earlier semester, when you listen to that, that is when your brain perceives this, you actually perceive these faster ones as continuous, so your perception change. Now that also illustrates the important problem I said principles that I said earlier in the class, that, that is our brain's, uh, per, our perception of the sensory environment is not a physical copy of that, but rather brain's interpretation. You know, I, I give you that uh, slides I will show you again, that, that a dark in a shadow on a pathway, okay? Interpretation, so, so therefore when you, when you hear seconds here being continuous, you are nothing wrong. It, it's not how your brain perceives this. The brain perceives as a continuous, even though physically they are discrete, okay? So what am I showing you here in this slide is that uh, there's one type of neuron in outer cortex that give this type of response that is a synchronized or physical to slow varying collections and stop responding altogether at a fast one. Now, this part of a response, which you can see, literally mimic what's in the physical structure of stimuli. We call this, strictly speaking, we call this, this is synchronized, which is indicating this follow this. But in the context of this principle, we call this isomorphic or faithful. So moving in the sense that uh, you see one click here, and you see one here, you see another one here, it's another one here. It's just like copy. It's exactly the processing I have taken my, put my hand in the Xerox machine, put a button, what come out is this. Okay, there's nothing special. It just bring capture the structure, physical structure in the stimulus. Now, this type of neuron, which I rushed through last, uh, um, at the end of last semester, uh, last lecture, not last semester, is that we call it non-synchronized. So this neuron, if you notice, did not respond much when this is slow. Collection, when collection becomes faster and faster, begins responding more and more by, you can look at oh, more and more dots here, and then you can quantify this by calculating fan rate versus ICI here. Slow, it going to this direction, is going to that direction. You see fire rate increase rapidly, about close to 20 milliseconds. Okay. Now, if you just look at here, you can no longer see the physical structure of here now. Because it has been integrated and transformed. This is what we meant non-isomorphic. Okay. This is a, a similar to the situation, if I, if I allow to make analogies, if I take my hand, put it some machine, it come out with something like this. I say, this is my hand. But you can no longer see my hand from here now because it has been transformed, okay? So this is perhaps a too simple example to illustrate this point that the, the brain um, can interpret and represent external physical stimuli by either a faithful representation or a non-faithful, non-osmorphic representation. Now, in this case, you say, why we want to do this? The reason we want to do this is the following, that it, each neuron's ability to follow a time varying signal is limited. Okay, neuron can run as fast as the synapse allowed. So when the change in the signal becomes so fast, the neuron like this can no longer follow. Other neuron taking these neurons integrate the signals within the time window, give our fan rate. So the change of fan rate, because there's a slope here, the change of fan rate would tell you that uh, there's a change in stimulus. That's an indirect coding, okay? This is transformation. Now, uh, the reason you have to do this in an auditory system is that, uh, I might say it earlier, the auditory system is much faster than other sensory systems, namely the visual system and similar sensory system. In vision, um, you have something moving with time variable, that is called a movie, right? I think I asked you guys earlier uh, in a class that uh, the speed at which that a movie, you know, is being played, that's about 24, 25 frames per second. Faster than that, you could not tell, 
concern or not, you could tell the discontinuity. That's where that that's where around the summer down here. Okay, summer down here. Now that frame of a uh, uh, movie, 24, 25 frame per second, is about what? Uh, if it's 25, that's about 40 hertz, right? So it's about um, you know it's it's 40, 20, 20, I'm sorry, 25, 25 frame per second. That's about 40 millisecond, okay? So that's about here. So you can see that's where actually movie, uh, you know, about which you can see it continues. Okay, so that because in a cortex, whether in visual cortex, or auditory cortex, or somatosensory cortex, neuron are very similar. They can only follow this fast. This is auditory neuron. You take a visual cortex neuron and can only fast here. However, because uh, auditory signals, uh, because by the nature of speech and music, it goes much faster than 24, 25 frames per second. Auditory system have to maintain this. So the way auditory system maintain this is by integrating the fast changing, rapidly changing signal into this type of what we call non-synchronized responses. Therefore, neuron can encode the fast changing signal without maintaining the temporal structure. Okay. This is very different than the way the computer would do as we you know, talked about last time. A computer that you have in your hand now or your cell phone, if you were to process the signal, would digitize it all the way down here, essentially maintain a synchronized or facial representation all the way as gone as fast as you need to. Right? And, and the nervous system doesn't do this. Nervous system basically break into slow and fast. Okay, that's the principle um, that I want to illustrate for this, which I think is a universally important principle across all the sensory system. Okay, be sure you understand this and be able to uh, 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 interpret it in other situations. Now, and we also talk about it for those two type of neurons. The single neuron, if average across population, that slide I showed you earlier, just a pair of examples. Here's the vector strength that is a measure of how much synchronization is. Here's the interval of a click trend, or slow here, fast here. As you can see, at a slow speed, most of neurons proportionally can track this. As the signal becomes faster and faster, proportion of neuron that can track here becomes the drug, or the strength of the neuron tracking is slowed down, eventually disappear. Okay. Whereas another population we call a non-synchronous population using fire, fire rate to the code began to pick it up. And this is border, it's about 25 milli, 30 milliseconds, about 30 hertz around there is where when you did that homework I gave it to you, your perception of collection change from discrete to continuous. Okay, it's about this place. This is also, uh, we might have mentioned this elsewhere, voice on the time of speech it takes place. So when I say da, ta, right? Da and ta only differ about 30 milliseconds. Uh, da is immediately, you make a sound. Ta, when you think about it, when you say ta, you actually hold it back a little bit. That's about 30 milliseconds difference. That's called voice on set time. That's all they tell you uh, between vowels. So this actually is an important point. Now the experiment I just told you showed that at the neuron level, in fact that this is neurons we record from mammals and monkeys and not humans, you can't record it for humans, that boundary is about the same as what we uh, humans perceive as a discrete uh, continuous. Okay. Um, that's what I show you. Now um, this is from a couple years ago, I, I got it from homework from this class. It's about you know, 28 milliseconds. And every year I will give a lecture um, in, the, in the university in China, Tsinghua University, and uh, for a class like this, I give them the exact same work. These are the Chinese students with native speak, uh, language as Chinese, and they come up with about the same number. So this number say, appear to be roughly, you know, close to somewhere between 25 or 30 milliseconds, seem to be independent of a culture and a language. In fact, seem to be independent of a species. Because in mammals and monkeys, we test it, they have about the same as what you got. Okay. So this is a very fundamental property that, that we have learned. Now, in terms of coding, and this part of coding, we call it express coding, because when you have signals spike synchronized the stimulus, you see exactly what the stimulus. Whereas the firing with the base, uh, this coding, we, call, we say it is implicit, because you have to interpret that. Okay. Now, um, auditory cortex, as you remember, uh, takes a signal from a thalamus, right? But now, uh, you should have the idea that uh, for all the sensory system, 
you start with the peripheral uh, receptors, auditory systems, ear, cochlear, visual systems, eye, retina, somatosensory system is a receptor on the skin. Then you end up, as we discussed in class, in cortex. Okay, that's two ends. In between, the pathways varies. Some longer auditory system, some shorter visual system. But there's one stage every system has prior to cortex, that is a thalamus. Okay, in visual system is lipogenic nuclei, LGN. In auditory system is medial suprasonic. These are acronyms. Uh, it's not that important, but the important thing is a thalamus. So that picture I showed you in the cortex, if we repeat this experiment in a stage earlier, in thalamus, this MGB is a middle genetic body. That is the auditory part of the thalamus. Okay? The two populations, synchronized population is here, and non synchronized population is here. Now, let's compare with the synchronized population in thalamus and the cortex. And look at the intercollect interval here. So, what you can see here, while cortical neurons can synchronize to you know, significantly uh, with, with vicar strength, about you know, this is 10, 20, 30 milliseconds right here. Thalamus neuron can synchronize to up to a few milliseconds. That's about what of magnitude faster. Okay, so that shows you that this this synchronization change is progressive from from peripheral to cortex, and you can see from here. Okay, that is slides I showed you earlier here. That synchronization is best in auto nerve. As you move progressively along the ascending pathway, synchronization becomes less and less and less. Okay. At the same time, the non-synchronized neurons, which I only shows here and here, become to increase from here and here. Okay. So then you have those two stages uh, that are together in code. So this meant to tell you that uh, these two populations uh, cross here in the cortex about 20 minutes, 30 milliseconds. But the cross in the thalamus is only a few milliseconds. So there's a progressive transformation. This is exactly what's happening for auditory system to take a very fast signal in speech and music and progressively slow it down until you reach the same speed in the cortex. Why you want this? Why you see why auditory system bother to do this? Because in the cortex, you have integrated signal from different systems. So when you go watch a movie, uh, if it's a foreign movie that has a, a voice over, and you often feel from time to time, I don't know if you, you guys have ever watched a foreign movie with, with, with people, you know, translate. And you feel from time to time, the sound you hear and the lip movement doesn't match. And the immediate feel is very odd. Right? Very odd. It's not right. Because Because so, so when people who are doing this business, actually they will try to match this. Why you feel odd? Because your brain expects auditory visual signal come together at the same speed. Okay. When it's mismatched, you feel it's not right. Okay. But since auditory signal is very fast in the ear, visual system is slow. So I often use the analogy for engineers just because you guys are maybe too young to, to, to take this joke. But, um, 20, 30 years ago, computers are not what you have now for, for, for you know, this is, a, this is an old PC. They use a system called DOS. How many of you have heard of DOS? DOS. Okay, good, good. After all, you're engineers. So DOS is very slow. Then you have a Pentium, all of that. Okay. So when you have all of, suppose all of computers are still using, you only link them to the same network. Right? As engineers, you know, you have to use the same clock rate to be able to go. A slow computer, you cannot make it faster. This is just no way. There is information theory. But you can make a fast computer go slower. This fast computer, in this case, is auditory system. A slow computer is a visual system. My visual colleague never liked this uh, analogy. But the visual system is slow. So when you have a slow system going on, there's a fast system, and it cannot go together. You cannot do this leap matching thing, right? So what they do, the auditory system do is through this process, gradually through down, by the time in cortex, both the system is about 30 hertz, okay? But by slowing this down, if it just slows down the auditory system, you lose a lot of information so that the music and the speech make, make un, un, it just make no sense now. So the auditory system basically take those fast signals, integrate them, make them in this, by this population. Therefore, you maintain them, you integrate them. Okay. So maybe one day, um, one day our computer will do the same thing because uh, sampling at fast rate costs a lot more energy and storage space than 
and than, than integrism. So a more efficient way for the computer to process speech, pipes, and music is to do what an auditory system does. Only synchronize at about 30 hertz and integrate the rest of them, put them in another form. Okay. But that requires different architecture so far so on. Okay. So that's, that's the, first, uh, uh, the last part I didn't finish last week carefully. So I'm finishing here now. So today what I'm going to talk about is two things. One of them is how does the auditory system represent the spatial localization? Yes. So are you saying that all the, at this point, like by the time it gets to the cortex, all the neurons are beating? Roughly, so yeah. So just each neuron has a specific frequency Right, right. That's because if you take the neuron structure in all the sensory cortex, all the visual smart sensory, if I grab a neuron, put in dishes, look at, you look at, you cannot tell. There are generic neurons. Then you look at connectivity among the neurons nearby, it's about the same. So sensory cortex are made about the same neurons, same connectivity. Therefore, their dynamic is, dynamic is about the same. This is necessary because there are a lot of information, the sensory motor information flow back and forth across cortex. If each system in the cortex, at the cortical level, if each system is made of a different uh, component, then you can imagine you cannot connect them. Right. So that is kind of top down um, uh, um, requirement that pose on. Whereas the peripheral system, uh, ear, eye, and finger, they're completely different, independent. Okay, that's good. Any other questions? Okay. Now, the next question we're going to deal with, so first question we talked about so far is how does the auditory system represent the time varying signals? Okay. This is an example to illustrate the principle that, it, that it transformation into a non faithful representation. Next one, we're going to talk about how the auditory system represents the spatial location. I want to use this to demonstrate this point that the CNS neurons can extract or compute stimulus information not explicitly encoded by sensory stimuli. Okay? We use a sound localization as an example. So, so here, here's what we need to know. So how do we tell the sound from? So if I sit in here, if I turn the lights completely off, you cannot see me anymore. I began to talk and all of you whether your eyes are open or closed, in this case, doesn't matter. People on this side should know I'm on your right side, and here people should know I'm on your left side, and people in the front should know I'm in exactly the middle, but in front of you, about the same level, maybe a little higher, but not on the ground, not on the back, right? So that comes because if this is our head, okay, uh, this is your left ear, right ear. So when there's a sound source coming from somewhere, not off the middle line, because of physics, the path to your left ear is closer than right ear if it comes from this side. Then your two ear, between two ear, you have two cubes. One is called the interaural time difference, ITD, because it takes slight split of second longer to, right, to arrive right ear than left ear. So you have time difference. And because also this difference in path in length, you would have also in total level difference. The intensity is different. Shorter path give you a slightly louder sound than here. So those are two physical cues that, that you can use to identify sound from left and right. Okay? What about sound from the middle? When sound comes from the middle, the, both cues are equal to zero, so you know exactly in the middle, you are in the middle line. But as you know, you know the someone speaking in front of you, above you, below you, or behind you, mostly, right? That comes about because we have this um, cue in the ear. So our ear, by now you notice that it, you probably, I don't know, haven't paid much attention. Your ear is, is not a trivial uh, a piece of tissue. It has percolate shape. In fact, if you ever look at somebody's ear closely, the shape of the ear is pretty odd. It's not smooth, and it has ridges, and it has tunnels, almost like that, right? In some movies, like Star Trek and other things, they make a ear really exaggerate, okay? Now, it turns out our ears, human beings, our ears are not meant just for cosmetic reasons. They're actually acoustic devices that are resonators. So if you do the following experiment, if you put a microphone here, miniature, inside of your ear, and play a white noise, a flat envelope in front, and at different locations. Then measure here. This is what you would see if you put a noise in front of a zero elevation. You have notches, like a gap here. Now, if you put noise above here, 
you have notches here, you put a below here, and notch from here. So it turns out, basically, when the sound source moves along the elevation, okay, and your ear generates a cue called a notch, spectral notch, and somewhere in your brain, that is getting picked up. This is how we tell. So basically, to tell which location in the space the sound comes from, the sound source comes from, you need the three cues, ITD, RD, and a spectral notch. So I'm gonna walk through how these cues are, are processed by the brain, okay? Now, here's a psychophysic that showing you how well we do uh, to tell, uh, how accurately we can tell uh, where sound comes from. So this experiment, if you someone sitting in the testing room, and uh, this is sphere indicated where the speaker location is. So if a speaker put in front of you, here show you how accurate you can do. Uh, if I give you a brief two minutes, very, very brief pop, you know, very brief noise or click, okay? And, and uh, this show you basically the arrow, the uh, ellipsis shows the arrow. You say we do pretty well. However, if we remove this speaker to your back behind you, and you can still do it, but you see, you have much larger error now, okay. Now, this is on the side of it so far so on. So you can tell, actually, we, we tell very well. So this is a situation where uh, in the front, uh, I'm gonna come back to, to the point again, but let me, let me mention again. So when you have a sound source from the front, for example, just like you know, birds on the tree, or a car coming, or someone speaking, you can tell the location by auditory system and visual system. Suppose you can see it. But when, when you have a sound source that come from behind your ear on the back, you only have an auditory system now. Okay, now think about this. This is uh, quite interesting because the location, physical location is the same for auditory visual system. But in the front, you have a two system you can work on. On the back, you only have one system. Okay, that's one point. Second point is that, think about the location, we we'll talk about ITD-LD talk about it. Given everything we talk about so far about cochlear, does the cochlear on uh, one side of the ear contain information to tell ITD, ILD? If you just look at signal behind your one ear, okay, can you tell anything about ITD, ILD? No, because this requires two years to compute. Now, this is the point I, I'm, I'm trying to make now, that is uh, for the brain to tell location by ITDA or ILD, brain needs to calculate the information that does not exist at the peripheral level. That means does not exist at the hair cell here, or basal memory, or auto nerve on one ear, okay? Now, how does the brain calculate this, compute this? So here's the neuron circuits that it, we've seen different version of this. Right after the year, in the hair cell, auto nerve, uh, auto nerve coming here, going to cochlear nuclei. You know, these acronyms, don't worry, I will never ask you to memorize this, but it just know there are a couple of neurons here. Then they continue, come to the structure we mentioned once by twice now, uh, medial superior oliver or lateral superior oliver. That's the aerosol, lateral, medial, uh, um, MSO. So these nuclei now uh, receive the inputs from both ears, this one and this one. So this is the place where two year and combine, and this is the place where auditory system began to do computation, computing sound location, start from here. Okay, how does it compute? So let's take a look at, the, um, at this MSO, that is this structure, uh, part of here, MSO. And so we take signal from one ear, if lateral, and also contralateral. Both come in mostly excitatory, okay, except that there's an inhibitor here, okay. So here is the illustration of this what's happening. Suppose this are the couple of neurons in the MSO of, of your, uh, of their brain, and here's the sound source, a loudspeaker from here. And when the sound is made, and it goes into left ear first, this is shorter, is on the left side, okay, and the right ear longer, okay. So now, given what we've talked about so far, you know what's gonna happen here. That is when, when, when the sound, let's see, is tone, okay, or noise. Arrive the ear here, and you should know everything about how all the transduction takes place, the hair cells, channel open curls, blah, 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 that we talk about. Then what happened is that next, that it, there will be action potential traveling along the outer nerve, continue to go this way, right? 
And then you should know roughly how fast the things travel. We talk about more than a few times now. Now you know why the action uh, position conduction velocity matter now. Whether it's uh, 30, 30, mili 30 meters per second or 3,000 meters per second, right? Let's travel here. Now, of course, this sound coming to right here also produce action potential traveling down here. Okay. So next thing is that the neurons in MSO, like this one here, this neuron has something very unique or that is have a very short temporal integration window. Remember the experiment number four we did in the lab, you did it with me, if you still remember, temporal integration. That was meant to illustrate. So these neurons have very short temporary integration window. Therefore, they require spikes, action potential from both ends to arrive almost simultaneously before the subthreshold can uh, reach the superthreshold of gap firing. Okay. And, and that, so therefore, um, if the reason we draw this one to illustrate point is this is shorter, this is longer. So time to travel from acoustic, from sound, from speaker to ear, plus time to travel action potential from this cochlear to this neuron is about the same for time to travel here, longer, but shorter here. So when the action potential from both ends arrival, at the same time, boom, that neuron fire. So therefore, this neuron could tell, okay, sound come from this source, let's call it E. Now, suppose you have another neuron on the right side, then everything reversed, okay? Then it would be this neuron that it fires. So this is something we call coincidence detection, and it requires a short time window. So now here's my question. Given what we have learned so far, that from my lectures, if I were to ask you what kind of properties of action potentials are traveling along here, so that it along this action potential, along those two sides, that could happen. That could make this happen. That is, uh, I, I told you one condition, that is uh, the path length in terms of time is about the same for this neuron. And this neuron has a short integration window. But there's one more thing that requires an action potential. For the action potential from both and they just meet and fire. Can it be any action potential? Action potential train, if, you take a, if I give you action potential train here, any action potential could happen on here or not? So suppose action potential here, because we talk about statistics property action potential trend. Suppose the action potential trend coming down this line or that line, a Poisson process. Poisson, randomly. Would this neuron ever fire? What is the chance of the neuron fire? The neuron require almost a simultaneous arrival of action potential of both ends. If two sides come in the Poisson process, what's the probability within a small time window you have two events together? Big or small? Very small. So statistically, the chance of this neuron to fire is very, very small. So they won't happen this way. So they, they cannot be Poisson processes. Then what else do you need? How many things will talk about the action potential for auto nerve? Auto nerve action potential. If you give the noise, if you give a tone, what do you have? Face locking. Right. So if each of nerve has a face locking that are, that are periodically, so the chance of them to meet at one point and again, again every cycle is very big. So you require face locking, think about it. So for this work, it requires auto nerve have face locking on both ends to work. Now, if it requires face locking, then what kind of sound this neuron E can detect? Can this be any sound of any sort? And then what do you require? What's the range of frequency where you observe face locking auto nerve? High frequency or low frequency? Low frequency. Now I'm um, connecting the dots now. Now you see why we talk about face locking. Face locking is actually crucial for here. This is the first time, place where in auto system people believe face locking is used. That is to extract the interoral time difference. Another place we're going to touch upon later on is people believe when you listen to music, a certain subtleties in music 
and a pitch has to be coded by face locking to some extent. But that's that's later on. So, so, so all of this together told you actually, in order to for neuron in MSO to detect ITD by coincidence detector, it can only do so for low frequency sound. Then what about high frequency sound? That's why we have IOD. Okay, that's why these two cues. Uh, some of you may want to have this question already. That is, uh, I said earlier, these are two cues when sound comes from off the midline. They are actually physically equivalent. If you design a computer with a fast enough speed, you can use one of them. Okay, so that is the ITD. Okay, now this requirement for for this to work, the align of this required this line up anatomically uh, for the different path. This is called a model called a delayed line model, and this is what in the textbook. This is you know classic textbook. It uh, turns out this is only true, unfortunately, this is only true for birds. Until about 10 years, 15 years ago, people thought this is a class. People knew this for a long time. This is the line, the very beautiful line of axons from both ends, one shorter, one longer, meeting somewhere in the middle. Only true for birds. It's not true for mammals. It's not true for humans. It's not however, in our ear. Okay? But we have to talk about this because this is in the textbook. You're probably going to read somewhere. Okay? So in this case, it's a delay line gave you a uh, tuning, ITD tuning like this, you know, like channel like this. And, and uh, you could have an array of them. Now remember the one of homework I give it to you, ask you to calculate uh, hyper accuracy. Remember that homework I give you this year? That give, I give you an array of this type of filters, ask you how, how fine you can, you can detect. It it's, has something to do with this, but, but that's something I would say. I don't know if you can remember. Now, how, what happened in mammals? So, uh, I'll give you this uh, review paper that is for all the sound organization lectures. You should really read it. Okay, you should read it. So, in mammals, this is what's happening. In mammals, you do have neurons, MSO, receiving inputs from both ear, mostly excitatory, but also inhibitory. But there's no evidence of this. In mammals, people just could not find evidence of this neatly, nicely, and systematically arranged action axons that just give you this calculation. So instead, what people find out is that there's interaction between excitation and inhibition such that when you change ITD, you get this kind of tuning. Okay. Instead of right in the middle, the peak, as you will see from this delay line model, the peak is off the line. However, this is where sound should be detected. There's a slope of this. So the argument now is that uh, the neurons detect ITD not because of the peak, because of a change of slope. This is very much reminiscent to a few minutes ago, I told you about the non-synchronized neuron when, when intercollect interval changes and the firing rate changes. Okay. And this is when ITD changes, the firing rate changes here. Now, of course, with this slope alone, just one of this slope is actually not enough for you to tell. Uh, you need both. If you have two neurons, one goes this way, one goes that way, then together you can determine the ITD. That's exactly what people find out in mammals. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to let you to read it. These are figures I copy from this, uh, this uh, article. I think you should read it. Explaining the this model, uh, opponent model versus uh, versus a uh, uh, delay line model. Okay, this is what classically you now in the textbook. But in few years, probably going to be replaced by, uh, by by this model for mammals. Okay, that's for ITD. What about IOD? Okay, IOD uh, works when ITD doesn't. That is when when ITD no longer produce the uh, face locking. So. The IOD is detected by neuron in other nuclei called LSO, lateral superior olive. So these neurons receive excitatory inputs from one side, inhibitory inputs from the other side through interneuron. Okay. So it has more or less a uh, basically excitatory plus inhibitory. Now these neurons, in contrast to the MSO neurons, they have a long integration window, long temporal integration window. So they do not require spikes from both ends to arrive at the same time. Okay. Remember the, the, the lab we did it together, 
a number of weeks ago. I asked you to test the temporal integration window of uh, two stimuli, how close they are, right? That's the exact right concept. Now, uh, and, and also the, the outcome that is the firing of these neurons is proportional to the net excitation. That is, uh, when the sound comes from the left, from the left side, it's stronger here. And you remember the curve we talked about last time, auto nerve. When the sound level increases, firing rate increases. That is, the higher sound level, the more spike coming. So when the sound arrives left ear first, it's stronger. So firing rate from auto nerve is larger than the ones from the right side. This is positive is negative. If that's the case, if it's off the middle line, then you will have a net excitation going there. So this is how the neuron tell sound from here. Now when you move the sound source to the middle line, when both sides are about the same, there is no net excitation. It's about a zero. So vice versa. You can read through here. So this is a pretty straightforward. Okay. Now um, this picture of uh, LSO so far has hold for all species that is based on uh, net excitation. And, and I will let you read it through here. And don't, don't worry about all the nitty gritty of wiring. The important thing for you to know for this is how, how the neurons in the LSO, OMSO extract this. Whether their, their uh, temporary integration window matters and what's in the action potentials that matters. So in this case, because we talk about net excitation, there's no requirement of face locking or non face locking at all. Okay. So, so all together, when we localize the sound across all the frequency, when frequency is low, we use RTD. When frequency is high, we use IOD. That's the two parts of our localization system. Now, I didn't have time to uh, um, mention the, um, the notch, but I did should say one thing. One of the very important work to tell where this spectral notch with the elevation is detected was done in a place called the dorsal cocker nuclei. I talk about it was done by, uh, by many interesting findings there was done by Professor Eric Young, who used to teach his class until last year, he retired, and his lab discovered many important things regarding the uh, detection of a notch, uh, just for you to know, okay? So the last part that of today's lecture I'm gonna cover is, is how does the artery system process pitch harmonicity? This is something extremely interesting for audition. Because remember, in the very first lecture uh, of auditory system, I give you a lecture to ask, tell you why we want to study auditory system. Why is this important? It's important for speech. It's important for music. Okay, and this is uh, this is uh, for that. Now, uh, this is a picture you see many times now, and, and I think this is my favorite picture to illustrate what's going on in the in the sound. Right? We talk about formats, and this is the first frequency here is the pitch. Okay, and uh, now uh, for those of you who have not seen this, so this is my favorite slide, so I'm gonna try it. Some of you know it. So how important is the pitch? Pitch is part one of the most important feature in audition, okay? And uh, my native language is Chinese. I grew up in China. I come to this country 30 years ago, slightly older than you, but as a graduate student. And uh, my last name was Wang. Unfortunately, 98% of the time, people say it wrong. And uh, here's what I go. I will just show you, for those of you who are not native Chinese speakers, what does the pitch mean, okay? So, and then we'll talk about how the brain process. So my last name was Wang, W-A-N-G. As you, most of you should know, in, in Mandarin Chinese, there's four tones, four Chinese tones, right? So it goes like this. So listen, I'm gonna mimic this now. It's Wang. Wang, Wang, Wang. You got it? You probably don't. I've tried this many times. When I come here about 20 years ago, uh, 1990, maybe 20, more, a little bit more than that, 1994, I come here for job interview for Hopkins. I was interviewed first in the Mandarin Institute, then biomedical engineering and uh, department home. So I gave a seminar. I was talking about using this example. So we we'll have a very senior professor sitting in front. So given this, just exactly what I just gave you, one, 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 one. I look at everyone, just, just everyone's lost. <laughs> I say, now I'm gonna repeat that one more time. See if you can hear this time. One, one, 
Wang, Wang. Is there a difference? Yeah, here's a difference. I'm tricking you. So <laughs> the second time, I just repeat this four times. Okay. The difference is very subtle. Very subtle. Now, if I give you a hint, so all I did when when I say Wang, basic syllable is the same. That is, it is the same. Almost is the format the same. All I change, I vary the pitch here. That's I change is the first frequency. Therefore, the gap here slightly change. But here's go. If you if you follow my laser point, I give you a little bit of hint now. You can get it. It's not. So, the first one pitch is stay steady. It's one, 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 one. That's it. And this. Is learned. There is no genetic for this. I once gave this homework to neuroscience graduate student class. A very smart graduate student in biology said, told, wrote, it, and she's going to find out the genetic genes for the pitch. As far as we know by now, pitch has no genes. It's really learned. It's called a categorical perception. So if you are a native speaker, which all of you actually can learn, this is not that hard to learn. If you put yourself in amongst learning, and then you will treat four of them as, as if it's are four music notes. It's just like a violin, you know. For those of you who knows how to play, it tiny changes, you make another sound, okay? Now, that's for native language, for, for, for the tonal language. Actually, for English, pitch is very important too. Um, uh, this is what you call this paralinguistic cue. So in tonal language, this is called linguistic cue because if you change, slight changes, means it's very different, right? So my name is a signet tone. It means king. I didn't make it up. There's someone confirm you. If you mix it up, that could mean vast for the ocean or for Nate, inter internet, the one of the words here, or forgot. So you can see how far it can go, right? So basically, for every Mandarin Chinese syllable, there are four tones, and then multiple of these, okay? Now, for English, here's what I go. So if you take this sentence, English sentence, uh, this example, I actually calculate the pitch. So in English, is a paralinguistic code. So when you say, uh, when we have a conversation, you, you know, if, if you come to border control, if they say, their immigration officer say, um, what did you bring to this country? You say, well, nothing, just a piece of paper. They say, are you sure? You know what I mean, right? When you say, are you sure? So, basic indicated indentation, the intention or, or skeptics, okay? So you say, yeah, I'm sure. So that's indicate, that indicated your confidence. So, so in English, this is a paralinguistic cue. Now, this is actually very important. Without this, your speech sounds very different. For example, sometimes you go to the hospital, you go to the elevator. Your elevator has, a, has machine voice now. It say, level three, please. <laughs> There's no pitch, right? Because engineers don't bother to put a pitch in. If you don't put a pitch in, it sounds very monotonic, right? So this is very important for, for, the, uh, for the speech. Now, how is this produced? This produce is actually pretty simple. Right here, we have a vocal fold. It's just you have a bump here if you're male. If you're not, if you're female, you still have the hair. If you put a finger here, you say ah, 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 ah. It's just, just a vary here, right? So this is how our pitch, pitch produces. The reason is that there's small memory with a little bit gap. So when we push the air through here, it vibrates. That vibration frequency is pitch. For male, it's lower, and for female, it's higher. So why is unique? Why is pitch so interesting for uh, speech music? There's another thing that's very interesting for pitch that you may not realize, even though you are an engineer. Okay, but you should for now. That is, uh, if I give you a uh, one year, I give you a pure tone, pure tone. Uh, if I give you 100 hertz, you can hear 100 hertz. If I give you a knob, I say make it higher or lower, you can change it. Then in another year, if I give you this frequency, two, three, four, five hundred hertz. Okay. I give you those four, four frequencies on this year. Then give you a knob. You can change one frequency tone. I say match them. You match exactly at 100 hertz. Okay? So that is for those of you who have done music, you probably know this already. But however, look at the signal. There's no 100 hertz. So 100 hertz does not exist. That we call the pitch, we call fundamental. Now, if I shift those four components to a higher frequency, five, six, seven, eight, nine country, you can still hear 100, okay? If I make the interval larger to 5, 7, 750, and 1,000, you hear 250. 
This phenomenon, which is a very important one, is called meson-fundamental harmonic pitch. So this pitch you hear from here is called meson-fundamental because it's no longer here. How important is this? I said many times by now that if you allow to use one parameter to tell is male and female, you use pitch because these are so distinct. Okay, but you may not realize that. Um, when you pick up a phone, okay, well, let me put it this way, whenever you p make a phone call, did you ever have a problem until it's male and female? No. But you probably don't know, it's about half a century ago, uh, engineers in Bell Lab figured out that you can transmit the signal without actual pitch. In that sense, human listeners extract the pitch from here. So where's the pitch in the real signal? It's here. It's here, 100 hertz, below 200 hertz. And when the telephone line was constructed and then was a cell phone, engineer basically filter, high pass filter anything below 500 hertz. Just get rid of them. Because as long as they keep the formats, you can tell what the sound is. When there's no physical pitch here, you extract the pitch from here. Remember, this frequency is the same as interval here. So basically, for all the time, all the people using phones are fooled by engineers. Because when you pick up a phone call, make a phone call, the physical pitch you produce or your other end produce was never transmitted. We never transmitted. And we can tell male and female because in this case, we evoke the missing fundamental. Okay, missing fundamental. But why you want to do this? Because the bandwidth is money. If you can transmit narrow bandwidth, you can jam more calls in the same bandwidth, right? You should know this, okay? So this is what is making pitch interesting. Now, the computation of a pitch is similar to the computation of this I told you earlier. That is, uh, when say that perception is brings interpretation of a sensor stimuli, you connect the dots, you say there is a dog, okay? <laughs> Just like here, you calculate the interval between here, between the frequency, you say there is pitch. But where does that calculation take place? Another thing we know is that this has a lot to do with how our brain perceives harmonics, everything to do with music. So if you do the following experiment, if you uh, test the subject, th these are the subjects at University of Minnesota undergraduates. I think the same for undergraduate Hopkins, if they were to do it here. And they give a student the, um, give a student the uh, consonant, which is more harmonic or dissonant, and ask people to read which one is more present. By and large, people read consonants more present than dissonant. That is, we prefer harmonics than inharmonic, right? You probably do, okay? Now, modern music have a lot of uh, atonal music. That's different. So we talk about, I restrict the music quote here to the classic sense that we all, most people like harmonic, okay? Now, harmonic turns out, pitch is harmonic too. It, it's not something only speech human speech has. If you look at animal vocalizations, this is vocalization of bats. You can see it's a harmonic. So bats make those sound. The multiple harmonic are coming by uh, echoes. And this is a vocalization made by the monkeys in my laboratory study, uh, called Marmoset. And uh, have you guys ever heard about Marmoset, by the way? Have you? No? No, you should hear about now because I'm teaching the class. <laughs> this is one of the most famous, interesting animals now in neuroscience called Marmoset. I go to Google, it's Google it, you'll see. And uh, if you ever want to see a real one, come to my life. So this, this is why we study this, because of the vocal. Head of vocal, it's a very interesting animal. So you can see here the harmonics, right? You can see harmonics. What is the harmonics? Harmonics, the frequency, double, triple, and the fundamental. Now, how is the harmonic pitch encoded? Well, given what we talk about now, we don't know, because this is the, the picture I showed you earlier in, in the cochlear. So suppose you, you think this is a piano board, okay? Frequency from low to high. If we play a harmonic combination on this board, would you see harmonic here? You see individual keyboard and together, okay? Now, um, where is the code? Now, if you look out your nerve, remember this is a picture we saw last, last week. Uh, this is the outline of vowel e. Uh, because the e uh is, 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 is a periodic, this is worth harmonic. Remember, this is a fundamental, twice, three, four times, this is harmonic. And uh, this is the uh, average firing rate representation of that we talked about last time. Can you tell harmonic here from here? No, you can't. There's no harm harmonic here. So in outer nerve that we discussed so far, outer nerve does not compute harmonic. 
it just captures every physical stimuli. So where is the harmonica captured? It's captured somewhere in, in the outer cortex or close to that. Okay. So, so here is what we've told so far. If you look at the uh, frequency response for outer nerve here, it has something like this, right? Frequency, intensity, roughly like this shape. This is everything we talked about so far. And it turns out this is true for much of the outer pathway. Okay. But somewhere in the cortex, somewhere here, people begin to observe neurons that are tuned to more than one frequency. Everything we talk about so far until this moment is this picture, neuron tuned into one frequency. And the most sensitive frequency at one sound level, at one frequency. But then you begin to see neuron tuned to two frequency. It turns out there are neurons in the cortex that turn into two, three, or even four frequency. And these frequency are harmonic related. And that is the basis for harmonic and pitch detection. Okay. Now here's a neuron that actually processes pitch. So if we take this neuron, give the pure tone, okay, tone change the frequency, that's corresponding to here. Change the frequency, the neuron is responding when the tone is in respect field. <laughs> then we test this neuron, have this harmonic complex. I just said to you a few minutes earlier, you will hear pitch. And when I shift here, pitch is the same. Because the interval of this is the same, right? And all of this is missing fundamental, and this neuron only responds to this one because this falls into receiver field. There's no real harmonic pitch here, none of them respond. This is a garden variety auto neuron. A pitch neuron does the following. When you stimulate with a pure tone, it responds just as if it's non-pitch neuron. But it, magic happens here, when you stimulate this neuron with this harmonic complex, it responds as if it is attracted to pitch. Okay. This is a work done by a former student in my lab, the Dan Bender, who used to be a TA here for this class a number of years ago. Now he's, uh, he's moved on. He's now a professor in University of College of London. This is a work from his uh, thesis. So here's what Dan found. Okay. It's about 10 years ago, uh, this work, maybe a little more than that. So for the pitching one, if you give a pure tone, uh, change in frequency, response is strongest in a sensitive frequency. And if you give this missing fundamental harmonic complex, neuron responded here. Okay. If you take this three piece, given one at a time, and there's no response until you combine. Whereas the neuron com is located, so this is a part of the brain that it, you probably familiar now. Visual cortex here, so my sensory motor, this is the outer cortex. If you enlarge here, this is the primary outer cortex frequency from high to low that we talk about here, and then another field low to high. So there's a small area here. This is about a millimeter in size that are the neurons that encode a pitch. Okay. Now identify this neuron. Actually, it's a lot of work. This is almost like finding a needle in a haystack. Now uh, that's where the pitch neuron is located. Okay. Now in humans, it turns out in last about 15 years, people identify same region in the human brain that encodes the pitch. That's why I'm here, the human brain is somewhere here. And this is the same as the one we find in monkeys. So this is a very interesting question because by now some of you should raise your hand and stop me from continuing because everything I told you about pitch in this class is for humans, right? We talk about the Mandarin Chinese, so we talk about music. I mean, how would a monkey, monkey doesn't speak Chinese, monkey doesn't enjoy them by music. Why do they have a pitch? Right, why do they have a pitch? This has a lot to do with, the, um, with how we interpret what is in the music. Okay. Music, for many musicians, think that's a toy that we human create and play to ourselves. But for biology, music is a way that we entertain or satisfy the mental needs through our artery system. So it's a biological needs signal rather than human's uh, arbitrary creation. So if you take that view, then you would argue that it, it is a structure in our brain, perhaps pitch neuron and other things, that it create music rather than music created them. Because in modern history of music, you guys know that for classical music from Western world, how many years has it been? Anyone knows how many years music has the formal 
classical music has been with human beings, society. How many years? Hundreds of years, right? Couple hundred years. What is the oldest uh, instrument that has been on earth, like human made? Anyone know it? Yeah, it's about 40,000, it's about 45,000, the oldest flute on earth in Germany a couple of years ago. All right, let's say, give it 50,000. So the music as we know as humans is with us, with the instrument, no more than, let's say 100,000, let's say double that. How long has our brain evolved to where we are? Millions of years. So there's a much longer course in evolution of what we bring are for this structure than what is music. So that's the reason that uh, finding pitch neuron like this in a monkey, uh, monkey uh, brain has a lot of implication on what is the music and how is the music processed by human brain. So we'll continue um, Wednesday. I'm gonna give one more lecture on Wednesday uh, uh, before we finish this. Okay, see you on Wednesday.